Hey, everyone. We're here back with the Ratitude Podcast, and I'm really excited today. This is the first female guest on our show. As you might recall, I had 10 um, episodes first where I just spoke because I felt like speaking. And then I decided I was going to start to invite guests. And it's so funny because I, I sent out probably about 30 invitations and 29 out of the 30 people responded right away say, sure, I'll be a guest on your podcast. So that was really exciting. But now I have to space them out a little bit. And um, it's it's been an interesting experience with doing that. But I'm really honored and pleased to have Karen Laurie here. Um, I met her a few years ago, and she coaches clients in living what we call true mastery, where you learn to how to have your body, subconscious mind, and conscious mind all aligned with what you want so you can win in all areas of your life. Now, Karen studied at uh, the University of California. Was that in Irvine, Karen? You see Irvine. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then she became an actress and she's been in like thousands of shows. It's really interesting. If you Google her, you'll find out that she's just been everywhere and uh, it's kind of cool. But that really served as a petri dish for her learning this mind, body, science, over thousands of hours of television and film. She discovered how much power we have over our own psychologies and lives and put that knowledge into use, helping thousands of people transform pain into pleasure. Wouldn't that be a cool thing to do? And she's written three international best-selling books, Chronic Pleasure, Effortless Enchantment, and Chronic Pleasure in Relationships. And she's showing them to us right there. And they're beautiful, <laughs> aren't they? <laughs> she's been endorsed by Deepak Chopra, Bruce Lipton, Gay Hendricks, and many, many more. And uh, I had the opportunity to play ping pong with her once, and it was really a lot of fun. And so, Karen, welcome to the Ratitude Show. Thank you so much. I'm glad you invited me. And um, hi, everybody. <laughs> yeah. So what we're going to do, we're, we're going to just talk a little bit about, you know, how your mind really formed to do this, because a lot of people I find are searching. You know, everyone's on a different journey, but they're searching for what what is my path? What is my journey? How do I, you know, find those keys along life so that I can become an international bestselling book? writer or whatever it is that they want to become. So I want to kind of go back um, to maybe your childhood, your college, your actress, kind of tell us a little bit about your path on how your mind developed. Because I remember you're brilliant. I mean, weren't you majoring in like biology or biochemistry or, you know, There's something like biochemistry. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I... Uh, but uh, I was I was majoring. I w well, I didn't have it as a major, but I was studying uh, psychobiology, how the mind affects the body. Yeah, but how did you decide to do that? Like, what what significant things happened in your life where you go, "Oh, I'm going to study biochemistry." I had a lot of trauma growing up, but it also opened up a lot of desire to understand things. So when I was in high school, I would. Don't tell, but I would ditch school in order to go read science books. And it was mostly focused on books about how psychobiology, how the mind affected the body, but also anatomy books and physiology books and all these things. So I was really kind of obsessed. And it was just a desire to understand things. And, um, and then when I got in college, they had that as a major. There were only two schools at the time that, or not as a major, but as a thing that you could study. There were only two schools at the time that studied psychobiology. And now I think it's called psychoimmunology, but you know, your how you feel affects your immune system. So that makes sense to me. And then as I was, I, I ended up getting acting jobs. Like while I was in school, I wasn't trying to do it. It just started happening. And I got all these acting jobs and decided to become an actress. I had one of those, you know, white light well, was actually golden light experiences where I felt like this is the most fun thing I've ever done was acting. And so I became an actor that the, I had a question when I was driving, I was driving one day before I had decided I'd been like three months trying to decide, stay in school, become an actor. What do I do? And this voice said, do you want to live a life where someone else tells you what to do? Or do you want a life of adventure? 
And I was like, adventure. <laughs> and, and I felt like that the medical world, which I was going to be a doctor, the medical world had so much of telling people what to do, you know, from outside sources. And so that's why I ended up going into acting, but acting while I was doing acting, I noticed uh, every different character I played, you know, there's a different thought process. There's a different emotional state, all that stuff. Every different character I played had a different physiology. And I'll just share this one thing. Cause it really amazed me was I was, uh, I was on a soap opera and I was plain pregnant. And so I had on a, a leotard with a pillow under it, you know, and I would wear it during the day. Cause it's really hard to take all your clothes. You had, they didn't have snaps. They should have had snaps anyway. So I would go to, um, lunch and everybody'd say, Oh, you're pregnant. And then I'd say, no, I'm, I'm an actress. And then they'd get mad at me. So I stopped <laughs> saying, saying I was an actress and I'd say, thank you. Yeah. Oh, do you know what it is? And I'm thinking, no, the writers haven't told me yet. Um, <laughs> But anyway, so I ended up, you know, behaving as if I was pregnant at this point when it happened, it was about four months in and the wardrobe girl came in and she brought in this dress I was supposed to wear and the bra I wore with it. And, um, she was helping me get dressed and I overflowed the bra and, uh, <laughs> and I hadn't gained weight. Right. And, and she said, Oh my God, you went from a C cup to a D cup. I got to get you a new bra. And, and I was like, Oh, this, this is what I studied in college. This is amazing. And so I, it was a really graphic example. I mean, my, my breasts were really like a whole size bigger for until I had the baby on the show, the fake baby on the show. <laughs> So, so hold on, hold on. You're saying that you, because of your thought process, that you got yourself so into character and using actor type language, but that you actually talked yourself into, and you know, physiologically you changed. Correct. Okay. And, and I, it, it, did you notice it at that time that that's what the power of the mind was doing? That's when I started to get the seeds of it. That's okay. when I was like, oh, this is interesting. That was the biggest, I mean, I'd seen it before, you know, you play a, you play a slut and then men treat you weird that, that during that time that you're playing the slut or you play, sorry to use that word, or you're playing a doctor or you're playing a, a Russian spy and, you know, and then you have different experiences based and not when you're on the set. I mean, also when you're right. on the set, but when yep. you're out in the world, things start shifting and so, um, and so I really saw how much power we have, I, or I was starting, it was trickling in. And then that time when my breast grew and then when they went down after I had the baby on the show, that's when I really went, Oh my God, my body is listening all the time. I'm impacting my physiology. Well, I better start looking at what to do, you know? And so I, it, I was working so much, so I didn't really study it too much at that time, but I also had studied while I was acting while I was on that show, actually, people who had multiple personalities, one person could have one personality could have diabetes and the other person or the other personality didn't. One personality had blue eyes. One personality had green eyes. One personality on, on the be, show or no, in real life. This is in real life. These are I used I've always read medical things. Uh -huh. So these were medical studies about people who had uh, multiple personalities and how their physiology shifted so much. So that also really informed me. So mm. like they could have literally one, one personality could be a, a junkie. And then if they switched personality, you know, right after they shot up, they wouldn't be high. I mean, it, it's amazing how much power we have, you know, and that they're using it in an aberrant way. You know, these people have these problems. And so they're just sharing the examples of how, how it is. But to my mind, it was like, Oh my God, look at what we can do. So you had that experience kind of early on. And then, then what happened in your life? Did it, did it stay dormant or did you continue to grow and evolve? I've always read science I really like, especially physiological sciences, um, epigenetics, neuroscience. Um, and then I like environmental science and I like, y you know, uh, physics, physics. 
Um, <laughs> but so I was, I would study these, these things consistently, even while I was acting, I just had a love for it. And mm-hmm. so it, things were, were piecing in, but it wasn't until about 15 years ago when I was getting divorced, I had not really applied what I'd understood in my life yet. And okay. I was getting divorced. And in that time, something I had like, an, a, a, I've had a lot of spiritual awakenings, but this one was really profound. And I started to, I'd been going to doctors and psychologists because I said like I had all this trauma growing up. So mm-hmm. I'd been going to doctors and psychologists. And then after I was getting, after I was divorced or getting divorced, I started to realize that I had shifted my physiology throughout my career and I should look at that. And I realized that when I was doing things that were fun, I had more energy because I had narcolepsy at the time. The, at the time I had narcolepsy, chronic pain, diminished eyesight, I had to wear glasses, thinning hair, weakness, um, you know, I, I depleted adrenals. My thyroid was off. I don't have any of those anymore. I cured the narcolepsy myself. I'd been to doctors and I had to fire them all and psychiatrists and psychologists. I had to fire them all, get off all the meds, you know, in a gentle, easy way. I titrated off, but um, I was able to heal myself from things that they said, you know, you're always going to have narcolepsy. Well, that's not true. If you know what to do, you don't always have to have whatever the disease is that they say you're going to live with. Cause Mm -hmm. so, so that, as I started to, I did a bunch of different things. I was meditating more. I was writing out appreciation more. And I was watching every time I wrote appreciation, I had more energy because narcolepsy, you fall asleep many times during the day. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, you know, I just started to put it all together and I saw my whole history, you know, like when you die, you see your life go be, I saw it in that, in that spiritual awakening where every character I played, I put it all together. Then every character I played, my physiology was different. I remembered the, the breast growing, you know, I remembered a bunch of other things and that's part of what happened for me where I could see that I had been, there's a line in St. Francis, the prayer from St. Francis, which says, God, make me an instrument of thy peace. Now I'm not religious, but I like that prayer. I like St. Francis mm-hmm. and St. of the animals. Um, <laughs> and so I realized that I had been, um, my instrument had been tuned. I'd let it be tuned by others, not by that divine power. And so I started. So if I'm getting this right, it was sort of this self-discovery process uh, for you. So you weren't necessarily led to it by going to a workshop where they teach uh, this. You kind of discovered it yourself for yourself. Well, I mean, yes, in some ways. But I had been, you know, I knew Bruce Lipton and I stayed at his house. I knew Deepak Chopra. You know, I hadn't stayed at his house, but I knew him. And so I had a lot of, because I still am interested in science. I'm still interested in, Bruce Lipton teaches epigenetics. Mm -hmm. Um, So I just had all this uh, hunger even while I was acting. Yeah. So, So I kept doing those things even while I was acting. So there were pieces, but I didn't put it all together until mm-hmm. after, after, after all that. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. So how did you put it all together? Like, was it epiphany or were you thinking about it or, you know, or was it because of your trauma and the, the challenges, the health challenges that you were had and you had to do something? Yeah. I had to do something because the doctors were making me sicker. I love doctors, but they were making me sicker with the meds and with their, what I call nocebos, which are, um, the opposite of a placebo, like, oh, you've only got six months to live. That's a nocebo. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) You're going to get, you're going to decline as you age. That's a nocebo. So I started Mm -hmm. to see the nocebos. And, um, and one day when I was meditating, all of a sudden I could feel this coalescing and I realized my life, the trauma that I'd had, the acting that I'd done, the studying that I'd done, the spiritual stuff I'd been meditating for I've meditated now for 33 years. So this whole thing had opened up and I saw how they could all come together. And I didn't know what I could do at that time. Cause I had literally fallen asleep 
at an audition on camera and I had literally fallen asleep on a movie on camera. Um, so I felt like I couldn't act for a while. You know, I was like mortified. Yeah. Instead, I didn't mean to, but my whole body healed within a few months, nine months or so, six or nine months from things I was doing. And I just made a, a post on Facebook, you know, hey, this is what I used to be like and this is what it's like now. And if anybody wants to talk to me about it, you know, let me know. And I got a client that day and then she referred people and she kept coming back and they kept coming back. And I didn't mean to be a coach. It just sort of mm -hmm. happened. Yeah. But it's, but it's, yeah. So, yeah. What What is your meditation process? Is it just sitting there mm, or is it guided meditation or what, what kind of meditation do you do? I do a bunch of different kinds. You know, I've learned how to do mantra meditation so I could do that. I know mm -hmm. how to do Vipassana meditation. I did an 11 day Vipassana retreat or 10 day. Um, I know how to do, um, but I've made up a meditation that I really like right now that mm -hmm. I'm doing that seems to be very um, powerful and I'll, I'll share it if you want. It's, yeah. it's, it's my own kind of thing, which is, so I have, I used to have PTSD, chronic PTSD. I was triggered all the time. I forgot to mention that PTSD and dissociation and bipolar. I don't have any of those. Anyway, um, <laughs> I realized that I had all these um, triggers, negative triggers. You know, if I heard the sound of keys, I would get frozen. If, you know, if somebody yelled at me, I would, I'd get shattered, right? So I realized, oh, wow, I have these triggers. And I, I thought to myself, how can I have... Um, positive triggers. And that night I went to my yoga class and my yoga teacher, they had just had their baby that day. And so he was coming to class and he was radiant, you know, and I said, how, um, how are you? How's your baby? And he said, Oh my God, the love, the love. And he starts like crying and I start crying because I could feel the power he had mm -hmm. of his love for his Ruby. That was her name. And so I, practice that all during the yoga class. I practice it on the drive home. I practice saying the love with him in mind until it became to the place where I could just say the word love and I feel it. Mm -hmm. And I've been feeling it for a while. So love is a positive trigger. I created it. Mm -hmm. So this meditation I do, and I, I created it by constantly reminding myself to feel that good feeling with some mm -hmm. symbol like a word. Now the meditation I do is I go through each chakra using, I start with love because that's my most powerful trigger. And then I use the momentum of that power to bring in something I want. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So, yep. so I'll be seeing, I'll say the word love, let's say, maybe I say it four times or 10 times, however many times I want to say it. And then I've got this really rich feeling overflowing in my heart. And then I bring in the having of what I want in my mm -hmm. mind, whatever. It is. Mm -hmm. So I'll say whatever it is, you know, that I want could be spectacular, so I, or help, whatever. Yeah. yeah go ahead. I, I, I read in, in part of uh, um, your bio or on Amazon that uh, uh, you're also into the law of attraction. Um, is, is it specific to that or with, with, what, with what you were just describing, is that the process, your process? That's just something I made up. Um, okay. I understand the law of attraction. You know, if you feel good emotionally, you're going to attract good things, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. and if you go bad, you're going to attract bad things, including bad health. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and the law of attraction helped me heal my body. Okay. Be because because I was sick, right. With all these things, <laughs> mental and physical sickness. And when I understood that I'd been focusing on the sickness, not on what I wanted, I had to shift it and start focusing on what I wanted. Now you also, you use the word bipolar I, and I didn't catch it. Where, did you say that you had bipolar or someone had bipolar and you, you yeah, healed I used it? To have, yeah. I used to have bipolar. I don't have it. I'm so balanced and I have good energy, but I'm so balanced and 
I never get triggered that, in a negative way. That's a huge thing because I'm I'm kind of familiar with bipolar, and um, I guess I have this belief from doctors that it's incurable. Right, and um, I keep running into more and more people that have a diagnosis of bipolar. And in fact, on my uh, vision board is is to create a bipolar treatment center up in the mountains someday. And I've been thinking about, you know, well, what would I really do if I did that? And so did you just will yourself out of it? No, no. Part of what I do for myself and my clients is I help people release their subconscious blocks. Okay. So how do you help people release? There's a whole process and it kind of depends on the person, each person, because people have different Mm -hmm. ways that they have carried a subconscious block or a, um, a belief system that doesn't work for them, that they've carried it through. So it's not, I haven't found a way to do it where it's, you know, the standard of care, if you will. I think everybody's unique. Mm -hmm. And so some people need one thing and some people need a different thing. So, but, but for myself, like the part of the way I healed the narcolepsy, I did a bunch of things to heal it. You know, I, I didn't stress out if I woke up at night, cause that's the other part of narcolepsy. But, in, but then one day I was relaxing and I remembered when I was three or four years old, I'd been on a, you know, in a bike parade with not a parade, but you know, uh, all my neighbors and me were, were mm-hmm. going, they were all older. They were on big bikes. I was on a big wheel and the sidewalk came up and I hit the part of the sidewalk and went headlong into a tree. And so I was knocked out from whenever that was like three in the afternoon, probably till, um, this was before I was in school. So it was pretty young until the next day around noon. So it was a really, um, long concussion and I had never someone really- find you. I mean, like we were just know. laying there. I don't know how I got home. I'm sure the other kids, came back or so. I don't know what happened. I, I was knocked out. So wow. I have no idea. And, um, and I didn't even know. Well, anyway, I like when, when I woke up, I was in my mom and dad's bed and I was like, Oh, that's so weird. I said, um, mom, what time is it? Cause she was in the room with me and she said, it's noon. And I said, Oh, I, and she goes, how are you feeling? And I said, fine. Why? And she, everybody, all the neighbors asked, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? How are you feeling? And I was like, what is going on? Cause I didn't remember anything. I didn't even know I had a, a concussion. I didn't know what it was. Right. So, um, but then I remembered when I was relaxing, uh, several years ago, many years ago, I saw my little body on the couch, my Dr. Bouch, my mom and dad standing up over me and my, I could see my spirit hovering above watching. And I saw Dr. Bouch say to my mom and dad, and this is old, an old recommendation, recommendation. It's not, apparently it's not the right recommendation now, but at the time he said, you have to wake her up every hour or she could die. And I saw my little body, my little brain take that in and think I better wake up every hour or I could die. That's how I cured narcolepsy. I healed that 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 I healed that whole situation and then I sleep like a baby. When did you when did you see that that vision of you know your spirit above you and see the doctor and your parents and little you? Were, were you were you little or were you big? No, this was a few years ago. Like um okay. 8 or 9 <clears throat> 8 or 9 years ago. Oh. Like that. Interesting yeah. because the way you were describing it, I, I recently I saw a movie called After Death, and it's about near death experiences. Um, but yeah. the description that you gave that the people in those near death experiences, and I don't know, you know, they're in near death, not in a coma. So it's it, I, there's I guess there's differences, but they are seeing and experiencing that at the time. So like right. at the time. Not, like- I think I was yeah. experiencing it, but I didn't remember it until ah. 
Yeah. I've had a, I've yeah. had a near death experience. All, I've had two. That was a near death experience, and then I had another one too. So yeah, I've had a couple near death experiences, maybe even three, but I I think for sure two. <laughs> and and for the others, um, at the time, could you see like your body below you and and see what was happening? The one that I remember the most, I didn't get knocked out. I was flung. I was doing spinnaker flying, but I didn't have enough weight to hold the the sail in the right proportion. Mm-hmm. And so, and it was for a photo shoot. And so the sail took me up, it inverted, and then it went above the 65 foot mast and then flung me onto my back onto the ocean. So I, I got the air knocked out of me. I got, you know, when I, when I saw later, I had black and blue up and down the spine um, all my nails broke off and I went down and it was out. We were out past, it was in Hawaii. We were out past where the land was, you know, like mm-hmm. this Hawaii is just a volcano. And then there's right. two miles of ocean below, you know, a few miles out. And so we were pr- out pretty far and I was going down. I had no air, no nothing. And I was drowning and, um, and I didn't know, I didn't have any energy. I couldn't, I didn't know how to get up. I didn't know which way was up. Mm-hmm. And then something happened and I felt like there was this light, this beautiful, loving light. And I felt like there were people there that I knew, but I didn't know who they were, but they were mm-hmm. there. And then I heard a voice that says, do you want to live or die? And I'm 18 and I think of my mom. I love my mom, you know, and I think oh, I want to live. And all of a sudden there's like rocket fuel under my feet. And I'm, I'm going up. I still haven't breathed. It's been minutes at this point. I don't know how long. And finally I get up. I still can't breathe because the, the diaphragm was stuck, you know, from the thing. And there's a guy from the boat trying to throw me a lifesaver. Really? And he, yeah, a lifesaver, you know, the round mm-hmm. things. Um, and, but he, but it was like 10, 15 foot waves, 15, 20 sometimes. And so where I was, you know, I couldn't get to it. And I started to go back down. I was, I was feeling like I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. I couldn't, I still didn't breathe. And so this is minutes of not breathing. And I thought, oh, and then I, I felt myself going back under. And again, I heard the voice, do you want to live or die? And I, I thought of my mom <laughs> and I thought I want to live. And then the next thing I knew I was on the lifesaver. It was, it was like 30 feet away. That's why it was so hard to get to, but mm-hmm. I don't know how I got there. I yeah. just know all of a sudden I was on there. He pulled me in. He carried me up the ladder. Uh, they had to pump my stomach. They had to give me mouth to mouth. I threw up water, you know I mean? <laughs> and, um, and then they said, do you want to do it again? And I said, no, <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was too windy that day. They shouldn't have done it. Um, right. But so that, that's where I felt like, oh, that was something I didn't really think about that in my life, you know, cause I 18 and I, you don't, I didn't think sure. about it, but I, but I used it later when I understood, wow, we have power to choose. When I really started to remember, I was like, wow, we have so much power to live or die. We have the choice. And that's what I've been. That's something that it helped me understand. Yeah. So now you've gone through this, this path, your path, and you've studied a lot and you've been around people and you've thought about it and you've written books. So most of the people listening on this podcast, they haven't done that. They're wherever they're at. And what kinds of, of sort of more basic advice might you give to some of the members of our audience to, to start or to accelerate their learning, their own growth? That thing about the positive trigger, let's say you're doing something you really like, you're at a comedy show and you like to laugh or, Mm -hmm. or you're um, playing a sport that you love or you're, uh, you know, making love and it feels amazing. If you can take the essence of that, something that feels really good, take that essence and then you practice moving into that feeling over and over again. It's meaning you'll think about it like, for example, if it was an actor, okay? So as an actor, people, a lot of people as actors, you know, they want more acting work, right? So I remembered when I was thinking about this, I started thinking, I'd hear my agent call, you know, you got the job, you're moving to New York, you got the job, you're going to South Africa, you got the job, you're going to Jamaica, you got the job, you're going to 
Japan, whatever, right? All those things. So I just started to create an excitement of that. That okay, excitement. I have a really a specific question around that because actually I've been thinking about this the last couple of days. Is oh, cool. do you focus on the feeling or sort of the scene that you've created? Okay. So the, the thinking about the phone call from your agent saying you got the job in South Africa, or do you think about the feeling as if, so it doesn't matter what the scene is. It's both. So when I have, when I, I might at first need the scene. Okay. Okay. And the scene gives me the emotion. Yes. And then, and then at a certain point, the scene is not relevant, but the emotion and the intention is. Okay. I really appreciate that because I've been thinking about this the last couple of days. It just happened to be, I was working with a client in helping her come up with a scene and, and she got it. And then it was very powerful for her. And I started thinking, is that the right way to do it? Because it was really the emotion, but it wasn't until I was in that, that it caused me to think about, well, what is the right way to do it? And then I kind of concluded that you do have to start out that way because I don't know that people can actually go directly to that emotion without that scene until they've trained themselves to be able to do that. Obviously you've done, you've been able to do that now because you've done it thousands of times. Right. And you don't need thousands of times. You need like a couple of weeks, three weeks, and it'll, you'll start to feel it. If yeah. you practice, it'll get more, more intense. But um, so everybody's different also. I'm yes. very kinesthetic. I'm very kinesthetic. Okay. So for me, I really like the feelings. Some people mm-hmm. might need the, some people might also be kinesthetic. And like, I can now get to things without a, without a, a vision of it. I just know what it feels like and I can just go to it. But a lot of people are more visual. So those people who are more visual will probably need seeing. Some people are more auditory Mm -hmm. and those people might need the hearing of something, the imagination of hearing something. It's really respecting which aspect of your um, physiology is the most dominant and easy for you Mm -hmm. to get to. The other thing I do is I write out appreciation and it is really basic. I start out really basic and then it goes to more, but you know, I appreciate my pen. I appreciate my journal. I appreciate the trees. I appreciate the sun. I appreciate a blue sky. I appreciate mountains. I appreciate the ocean, you know, and I'm going through it. It's stuff that's simple. I appreciate that. I, my heart beat for me all night long. I appreciate when do you do this. When do you do it? I do it before I meditate. In the morning or nighttime? Yes, both. Both. Okay. And you actually write it out. I do. It's, it's, I mean, some people don't like to write. Mm -hmm. You can dance it out. You can talk it out loud. You can, that's why, that's why I'm saying everything's so, so, you know, everyone's so unique. If they don't, I like to write. I just always have liked to write. Um, yeah. but some people, if you don't, you know, like I know people, they would just, uh, put on, you know, some song that had fun lyrics, you know, love and happiness mm-hmm. or whatever it is, you know, <laughs> and yeah. then start to dance to it. And that's, that's how they would get into that feeling. Um, and some people, you know, like to work out and some people like to cook and some people like to go on a hike and be in nature, whatever it is that works for you. That's where you want to go, where you feel the most juju, the most juice, that's where you want to go. Yeah, I think that's so great. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to have some incredible people on as guests because everyone's process is so different. And and I've been trying to remind my audience that I've got my path, but that's not going to be your path. It's just my path and discover what your path is. And now with incredible people like you coming on, that's why I want to kind of dig into what was your path so that people can think about it because it's sort of becoming conscious of your 
your unconscious because people have been on a path whether they know it or not. But starting to recognize that and then thinking about what you just said, oh, am I kinesthetic? Am I auditory? Am I visual? What am I? And just by the process of thinking about what you're thinking about helps you then in the future design your own path or recognize that you're on it or you could or that you could co-create it. Exactly. Yeah. So currently, currently, what kinds of things are you thinking about that you want to create or heal or change or do in your life specific to you? Well, one of the things that is specific to me, but it involves the world is peace. So I'll do, so so I will, I will think of love because love is, love is peaceful. Um, so I'll, I'll think of the love to get me going. And I've also written out and the appreciation, which by the time I've written it for a minute or two, I'm sobbing with my heart mm-hmm. overflowing with appreciation. Yeah. Cause Oh, here's the other thing. One of the things that people do is they do appreciation from their mind, but our heart is the pilot. Mm-hmm. And when you write from your heart or when you speak from your heart, it's a different energy. And it allows people to get their connection with their body versus being in the head. I'm not in my head (laughs) very much. Okay. How do you tell someone, how do you tell someone to think from your heart and not your head or write from or appreciate from it or love from it? How do you actually tell someone that? Okay. So just imagine right now that you're breathing into your heart. This is the first exercise I think in in almost every, in the two books that I wrote that are, um, that are helpful books. Mm-hmm. I mean, that I think some more might be helpful, but the ones that are meant to be helpful. Um, so the first thing I would do is I breathe into my heart and then mm-hmm. I'm imagining that my spirit is caressing my heart, massaging my heart or your heart. You have to give people, I give people a, a physical, experience. Mm -hmm. So doing that, and then the heart has more nerves going from the heart to the brain. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm bringing in, I'm bringing in the love. I'll feel that in my heart. I'm bringing in, um, like I breathe in gentleness or kindness. I breathe in softness or power, which are the same thing. And then as I'm doing that, the, the heart tells the brain, ah, you can relax because you have your attention here. And then I put the attention of whatever I'm wanting to the love. I might start it in my heart while, while I've got that feeling and start saying, you know, love, love, love. So now it's already affecting me in emotional, positive, emotional way. So then I would say peace. And I imagine the love and the peace going around the world. And I do this for myself because I want peace, (laughs) but I want it for everybody, you know, not just for me. I want peace and I want freedom for everybody. And so I just imagine it caressing the world, holding the world, loving the world, soothing the world. Okay. So a few days ago, I'm, you know, I'm in the Dr. Joe Dispenza world and, and we did that here in Naples. A bunch of us went out to the beach and we did a uh, walking meditation for peace. And we have a, an audience here and we have me here. Would you kindly lead me and whoever might be listening to this in a couple of weeks when this gets posted in a, a whatever it is for peace right now. And let's see if we can impact. Let's do it. All right. So um, whoever is listening, unless you're driving, don't do this if you're driving. (laughs) Listen to it later. But if you're not driving and you're safe, uh, close your eyes, taking a deep breath. And let your exhale be longer than your inhale, which tells your body that you're safe. And breathe into your heart. Breathe in some kindness, gentleness. Just feel it sort of soothing your heart. Allow yourself to breathe in love into your heart.
and allow your heart to relax. Allow your heart to be softened by this kindness and gentleness and love. And maybe you can feel the pulse in your heart and feel how it's like a gentle massage. And now imagine that as your heart is opening, you have a better capacity to perceive and to feel the presence of that divine intelligence that is everywhere. And imagine it's in your heart, soothing your heart even more, caressing your heart. And now just imagine that you're breathing in peace right into your heart. And recognize that your spirit is always full of peace. And just keep with every inhale, breathe the peace in and then let it fill your heart with more peace. And keep breathing peace in and feel that peace move throughout your whole body And now feel it in your energy field. And recognize that your energy field is infinite, eternal. And f allow that peace to ride on that infinite and eternal aspect of your energy field, of your spirit, of whatever you want to call it. And imagine that you are, you and your energy field are bigger than your state, bigger than your country, bigger than this beautiful planet, bigger than all of creation. And imagine that your infinite, eternal, and unconditionally loving energy and spirit are allowing you to expand out beyond all of what is known, all of creation. And then imagine that all of creation is like a tiny little speck in the vastness and magnificence of who you really are. And now as you see that little speck, it's in your energy field. Allow yourself to imagine that your hands are surrounding all of creation. And the heart, your beautiful heart that works for you all day and all night, is flowing love from your heart out through your hands to this precious, beautiful, abundant, extraordinary creation. And just feel how or imagine peace moving through every solar system, every planet, every star, every black hole. Just imagine the peace, the tranquility. Imagine the calm and allow it to infuse throughout all of creation. And you can imagine, since creation is so tiny compared to you, 
that you keep this creation with you and you are always sending peace and harmony and freedom to all of creation. And there's a beautiful spiritual axiom, which is that you cannot transmit something that you haven't got. And so the best way, in addition to this meditation, to allow for peace is for you to be peaceful, for you to find that tranquility, that peacefulness, and to be in that state before you do anything else. And you'll see that you You influence those around you when you are in that peaceful state and they feel it and they feel relaxed. And so imagine that that peaceful state is surrounding all of creation. It's diffusing into every particle of creation. And it's the deepest truth. And imagine that all the people on this beautiful planet, they're beautiful, they're worthy, they're important. And imagine that peace permeating them, drenching them, saturating them. And just feel that sense of connection We are all connected. There's no time that you can ever be disconnected. We are all drops in the divine ocean of love. And imagine that that peace, that love, that freedom is sourcing everyone and feel that calm and that tranquility within you. And you might imagine that everywhere in the world, people's hearts are smiling. Love is pouring from their eyes. And you can keep imagining this as long as you want, but I know we have a time frame. So I will let this go. Um, You can take in a deep breath when you're ready. Stretch your body if you need to. And this is something I do daily. I like, you know, it it varies every day. There's a little difference, but I, I imagine, imagine people smiling. I imagine people locked, you know, elbow to elbow, in a, as I walk along, I imagine people having fresh, healthy food and, and smiles and babies laughing and kids playing in the street. That was, that was beautiful, Karen. And I think that, um, people are doing that. I know that, uh, a lot of people in the, the, in my world are doing that daily too. I'm going to be going to the beach here shortly at uh, 430 and uh, uh, doing another uh, meditation for World Peace too. So uh, maybe our little podcast here will influence a few more people. And, uh, um, you know, you have such an amazing smile that it's infectious and uh, it, I'm sure, is bringing peace to lots of people that you get to or that they get to um, come across your path as you did for me. Thank you, if, if someone wants to uh, reach out to you or wants more information, what would you suggest for them? Uh, the best way to do it is to go to chronic, C-H-R-O-N-I-C, pleasure, P-L-E-A-S-U-R-E. That's what I live in. Book, uh-huh. chronicpleasurebook.com. And then okay. you can download my books and my contact information is at the back of the book. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being on our Ratitude podcast. You're an amazing woman. And uh, let's lock arms and go uh, help the world find some peace because we need it right now, don't we? (laughs) Yeah. 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 And I would just, I would just uh, constantly imagine people being happy, you know, that's, that's part of it. You know, I just, and and even on like customer service, you know, if you're talking to someone on customer service, yeah, 
bring your peace, bring your love. If you're at the grocery Wait. store, bring your peace, bring your love. We're going to do that. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, I appreciate you. you and continue to live your beautiful life. Appreciate you so much. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. 